Happy Sabbath. Happy day. Uh, are we on? We can continue. Yeah, everything is set. Okay, then I think the others will be joining as we proceed. So we will, of course, start uh, our session for now by having a word of prayer. Let's pray. Our mighty Father in heaven, we come before you to thank you once again for this opportunity that you have granted us to see this day in which we are resting both spiritually and physically, Father, even as we partake of your divine food from heaven. We pray that you'll be able to continue to teach us, Father, that you might be able to delve into the deep truths in thy word, Father, through the Holy Spirit, who shall be able to apply the teachings, Father, in our lives. Be with us as we now want to continue with our study and even the previous study and the remaining studies until we shall be able to come out of the Sabbath for this our humble prayer, trusting and believing in the precious name of Christ. Amen. Uh, so we thank the Lord once again for the messages that we are continuing to get. We thank God for the morning message. And uh, we pray that God shall be able to give us the grace to really uh, interrogate and chew and assimilate these messages that they might translate into an experience in our lives. Because that is what we are told that uh, God is actually waiting for. Now, we want to look at justification by faith, present truth in this session. Uh, this message that we are referring to as Christ, our righteousness or justification by faith. I mean, how, how much is it present truth? Where does it rank in terms of priority, in terms of uh, what we should be hearing in the churches as far as uh, these other topics or pillars of our faith are uh, concerned. We want to have a fairly, I hope it will be short session, by looking at some few statements by Ellen White in the spirit of prophecy, that when we look at carefully, should actually show us what kind of priority we should be giving this message or this topic as opposed to the other maybe uh, topics that we usually have whenever we are sharing in these uh, last days. So we'll start by looking at uh, page uh, 64 where, which these are quotes that you have looked at in the past, the past previous studies. The first one is saying that uh, several have written to me inquiring if the message of justification by faith is the third angel's message. And I have answered, it is the third angel's message in verity. So the message of justification by faith is the third angel's message in verity. In testimonies to ministers, page 91 and 92, she says about the same message that the Lord in his great mercy sent a most precious message to his people through Elders Wagona and Jones. It presented justification through faith in the surety, it invited the people to receive the righteousness of Christ, which is made manifest in obedience to all the commandments of God. This, she says, 
that this is the message that God commanded to be given to the world. And then she continues that it is the third angel's message, which is to be proclaimed with a loud voice and attended with the outpouring of his spirit in a large, in a large measure. So here you find that the terms justification by faith and Christ our righteousness are used interchangeably. So therefore, the message of Christ our righteousness is the third angel's message. And this is the final message that we see in the book of Revelation, in Revelation 18, of the angel that lightens the whole world with his, uh, with, with his uh, glory. Now, the last quote is uh, coming from Rivian Herald, November 22, 1892, also found in uh, Bible Commentary, Volume 7, page 984, paragraph 6 where Ellen White here uh, says that the time of test is just upon us. For the loud cry of the third angel, the loud cry of the third angel has already begun in the revelation of the righteousness of Christ, the sin pardoning redeemer. So the time of test is just upon us for the loud cry of the third angel has, has already begun in the revelation of the righteousness of Christ, the sin pardoning redeemer. This is the beginning of the light of the angel whose glory shall fill the whole earth. So throughout spirit of prophecy, you will find reference to these terms, the third angel's message, the loud cry, and you'll find that they are used interchangeably. Justification by faith, Christ our righteousness. They are either all connected or they are synonymous in their usage. So this is a message that if you look at these quotes, it shows that this message is unique. Although we know that we are justified by faith, ever since uh, this a uh, monk who led the reformation, Martin Luther, discovered the text that the just shall live by faith. We know that although in the Christian uh, history, we will find that people are only saved by faith in the merits of Christ. But in these last days, what we are reading from the spirit of prophecy is that this righteousness, the message of Christ, our righteousness, has a special quality that was probably lacking in the previous eras in Christian history. Why? Because you will find that this is the last message that is given in the book of Revelation 18. You find that the last messages that are given are the three angel messages, the three angels messages. But then we find in Revelation 18, the loud cry of the third angel is the last message. As in this is the message that joins the third angel's message. And then we do not have any other word, any other message. This final message will lighten the earth with the glory, which we will look at of God, bringing a close to God's uh, final work upon uh, the earth. So the question we will be looking at, why is it that this message from how we've been studying and what we've studied is so much pushed to the periphery, yet from what we are reading in the spirit of prophecy, it should be right there in the front. This is what should be told to the people. This is the message that is supposed to rank fast if what we are reading is actually correct. The people are supposed to be constantly reminded of this message that Christ is both to them salvation and what? And righteousness. This is what should be able to spur them to produce these works that are required uh, in these last days by God's uh, people who are supposed to be calling others out of Babylon and preparing them for the second coming of 
Christ. So you notice that it has been delegate, delegated so much to the back that sometimes you find that it's like we think we can be able to finish God's work without this, this message. This message from what we've read is present truth. Justification by faith is the present truth message, is the truth that we need to spend time on in this last word, in this last uh, days. And therefore, by the way, we saw from the quotes that we have read, it was the beginning of the loud cry of the third angel. And then in 1888, something happened. It was not received. So could this be the reason why we are still so many years in this world and Christ has not actually done what? Has not uh, come. So the quotes are telling us that the third, this is the third angel's message. It is not only timely, but it is very urgent because the alternative is for people to be lost. If, if you look at the third angel's message, what it, uh, the warning that it gives. So we, we, we can come up with our own uh, messages and attach to them uh, um, importance. But from what we read in the spirit of prophecy and in the Bible, this is a message that is uh, very important. You know, when the seventh day Adventist movement, like we're told in the morning, uh, began. There was this sense of urgency. Actually, from the Millerite movement, when they thought that Christ was going to come in 1844, it was a time of extreme urgency. And therefore, you read the stories then, farmers would let their crops rot in the farm because now the world is going to be cut short and they have to prepare because some of these things are not now going to help them. People did very many things that showed that they actually believed that Christ was coming the second time. So this church was born out of that movement, the disappointment, and then they went back and read the scriptures and they were given truths and they understood these truths and then the message was brought by Jones and Wagner, but sadly we are told that it was rejected. So from 1844, we saw that we, the, we are waiting for events, certain events to happen, no more time prophecies. And the events include this loud cry of the third angel's message, which we are being told here is justification by what? By faith. So that sense of urgency, when this movement began, they knew that only a short time, when they do their part, then Christ will do his work through them and then the history of the world is going to be cut short because Christ was going to come within a few uh, years or a short time. But as we have become a church, we have become so formal that that sense of urgency is no longer there. We are just being pressed to do things. And the sad thing is that if we continue like this, sleeping, we will find ourselves like before, that in such an army, that is the time that he will come and he's going to find uh, us unprepared. So we need to understand this message and through it, look at the times in which we are living and everything around us through the goggles of this message of Christ our righteousness. Otherwise, we are going to misunderstand issues. We are going to pervert them, and then they will not mean to us what they uh, should mean to us. We looked at how the greatest danger that we have as a people is to look at ourselves and the law and the third angel's message through a legalistic viewpoint. That is the same trap that the Pharisees uh, got into. Now, this brings about terrible misunderstandings. For we are told that the third angel's message is Christ, our righteousness in verity. We might be looking at it like externally that, okay, we are told that the mark of the beast shall, be, when it is mandated, it is mandated by law that we worship on what? On a particular day. So we look at, again, at externalities, at the external keeping of what? Of this law. So to look at this message through legalism is to corrupt the message. 
that God intended will finish the work. We need to look at it from which angle? Christ, our what? Our righteousness. So when we are able to see the issues of our day through the eyes of Christ and his righteousness, suddenly we will understand where we are in the stream of time and how urgent the days are. We will also be able to have a clearer vision of Christ and his uh, righteousness. It is not something that we can play around with. It is not something that you can say, this one I will decide later because that later might end up being what? Being too late. There are similarities between Christ, our righteousness, and the third angel's message that sometimes we do not uh, see. Now we are told that the loud cry declares that Babylon is fallen. That is, if you look at Revelation 18 2. So if it says Babylon is fallen, and we saw that, by the way, the book of Revelation, the terms that it uses, I can't remember the percentage that are borrowed from the Old Testament. You need to go back to the Old Testament and exactly find out why was this term borrowed by John? Because you'll find similarities between the literal Babylon then and this spiritual one in this last word, in this last days. So you need to study Babylon. We are told that Babylon is fallen. And in terms of Christ, our righteousness, what you notice is that is Babylon, some of the few things that you can pick. Babylon was a symbol of self-righteousness. A do it yourself. Use your own efforts and your own strength. This we read in the book of Daniel 4.30, where Nebuchadnezzar is saying, is not this great Babylon that I have built by the might of my power and for the honor of my majesty. Very interesting here. So if you're looking at it, that it is a symbol of self-righteousness, you find that here we have Nebuchadnezzar talking about himself throughout. This is great Babylon that I did build by the might of my power and for the honor of my majesty. Now, this is the reason Babylon fell. Because the same spirit persisted in the grandson, Belshazzar, during the feast that night, as you will read in Daniel chapter 5. So when Daniel is called, Daniel reviews to Belshazzar the experience of the father because he tells him in verse 22 that, and thou, his son, O Belshazzar, has not humbled thine heart, though thou knewest all this. Though you knew the reason why your father was uh, humbled, you are still continuing in the same spirit of I, I. That is, you are totally ignoring what caused the humbling of your father like an animal for those years because of pride and because he was contesting with, with God. Now the third angel's message has to do with commandment keeping, another thing. And in Daniel 7.25, we are told that there is a power that thinks to change times and laws. So Babylon prefers to have man-made laws, man-made laws. In Revelation 13, it says that all will be caused to worship this power and its commands. So this is accomplished first of all by deception, miracles, deceiving the masses through the miracles that uh, the lamb-like beast shall do. And then by a decree prohibiting buying or selling for all who do not submit to this word, to these commands. So in Revelation 14, 12, we are told that God's people on the other hand, the book of Revelation, by the way, is very interesting. It is like a chess game. God does this and the devil does this. So every time you read what the devil does, you know it is to counter a move that God has done what, has made or is making. So in Revelation 14, 12, we are told that God's people, there will be God's people who will be keeping his commandments. But why do they keep these commandments? Is it the same way that the beast will cause people to keep his commandments that are man-made? No. Are they forced to know? Jesus said, if you love me, keep my word my commandments in John 14, 15. So there is a difference between causing them to worship and wooing or winning them so that they love and obey him and keep his commandments in response to the love that they have received from, from him. So these are some of the interesting things that come up when you're looking at this message like we have been told in the spirit of prophecy that the third angel's message in verity is the message of justification by what? By faith. Now Jesus 
taught that the law, we looked at this, was supreme love to God and love for our neighbors as ourselves. In the book, Revelation 18, in the loud cry of the third angel, we are told that Babylon has an intimate love affair also. It loves, yes, but not with Christ, but with the kings of the what? Kings of the earth. She loves, but not Jesus. She does not, in addition, she does not keep the second half of the Ten Commandments because she causes those that should not worship the beast to be killed, which is exactly not loving your neighbor as you are, as yourself. And we looked at this, I remember mentioning that for those who will be listening and who are not understanding the events in the last days as they are unfolding, one thing you should be sure of is that whenever you think that you can cause another person to worship God by force, know that you are worshiping the wrong God. You have been deceived. Otherwise, we will not be here. God will have forced everyone to worship him, and you will not be having this freedom, individual freedom, especially in the last days where it will belong in the mind because outward we will be forced to do things by the beast that we sometimes will not uh, want to do. So when you find yourself supporting a system that wants other people to be forced to worship in a certain way, clearly, you are in the wrong in the wrong camps. So this beast loves only places. She does not keep the second half of the Ten Commandments because she causes those that should not worship the beast to be killed, which is not exactly loving your your neighbor as you as yourself for whatever reason, plagues or you whatever earth will be in chaos, the weather will be in chaos, and I think there will be some other miracles that will be done to convince the people that a small group of people are the ones who are causing these things. So the mistreatment of human beings, the unkindness to others, is part of the activities of the enemy of Christ, and yet they will claim to be the commandment keepers. They claim to obey God and to represent him on earth. So these are some of the things involved in the third angel's message and the loud cry that may help us distinguish between the third angel's message and as we understand it from a legalistic point and Christ our what? And Christ our righteousness. On the other side, in opposition to this power, we will have God's people who will be shining for Christ. Those who obey God and truly love him. And they will also love their neighbors as they love them themselves. And this will be made manifest to the world, which we want to look at how. So we want to look at the meaning of the third angel's message from the viewpoint of Christ, our righteousness or justification by faith, as we have also looked at it uh, in the past. It says in the book of Revelation 18, 1 to 5. Revelation 18, 1 to 5. That after and after these things, I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, it's fallen, and is become the habitation of devils, and the hold of every foul spirit, and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her. And the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. For her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. Now this is what we call the loud cry of the third angel. It seems that as the third angel's message is going forth, Another angel comes with power to make the message more what? More effective. Notice here some of the words that are used that we want to look at. The earth is lightened with his glory. What is the glory that lights up the earth at this time? We are told it is not literally the angel. In the Greek language from where we get the word uh, angel, we know that it means a messenger. So the word angel is a symbol 
of a message that sweeps the earth like an angel encircling the world. But it is not the glory of the angel. It is the glory of the what? Of the message. So what is the glory that lights up the earth? We are told in the book of Isaiah 61 to 3. Isaiah 61 to 3. Arise, shine, for thy light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. For behold, yeah, arise, shine, for thy light is come, and the glory of the Lord is, ridden, is risen upon thee. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and gross darkness the people. But the Lord shall arise upon thee, and his glory shall be seen upon thee. And the Gentiles shall come to thy light, and the kings to the brightness of thy rising. So this is a command to arise and do what? And shine. And why should we arise and shine? Because thy light is what? Is come. You are light and my light and the glory of the Lord is risen upon us just like the sun that rises in the morning. So this is the prophecy of the light of Revelation 18, that something tremendous was going to happen to lighten the whole world, the whole earth. Now remember Jesus in Matthew 5, 14, when he says that you are the light of the world, of the world. You are the light of the world. In Isaiah, it says that you are to rise and shine for your light is done what? Is come. Now, Jesus also in Matthew 5, 16 says that let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and then glorify who? Glorify your Father, which is in, in heaven. So through good works, light is to shine out to the world. And we are told that the result is that God is going to be done what? To be glorified. Why God to be glorified? Because they know that it cannot be done by any human effort. So the light spoken of here is good works, not just good works, not just good words, huh? but the works. Although the words will also be there, of course, speaking about the right doctrines, but it is talking about good actions that the world is going to do what? To appreciate. So literally, the people who are involved in the loud cry will shine. In the book of early writings, page 277 and 279 to 279. Ellen White mentions this in several places. One of the earliest books that she wrote, listen to what she says, early writings, 277 to 279. The several places where she mentions uh, this. It says that the work of this angel, the work of this angel comes in at the right time to join in the last great work of the third angel's message as it swells to a loud cry. So the work of this angel comes in at the right time to join in the last great work of the third angel's message as it swells to a loud cry. Then I saw a great light resting upon them, that is God's people. And they united to fearlessly proclaim the third angel's message. And they united to fearlessly proclaim the third angel's message. Then jumping again, the glory of God rested upon the patient waiting saints. The glory rest, rested upon the patient waiting saints and they fearlessly gave the last solemn warning. The light that was shed upon the waiting ones penetrated everywhere. And then, Servants of God endowed with power from on high with their faces lighted up and shining with the holy consecration went forth to proclaim the message from heaven. So here they are endowed with the power from on high which does what to their faces? Their faces become lighted up and shining with the holy consecration. And then the last uh, statement jumping. 279, God's people were strengthened by the excellent glory which rested upon them in rich abundance and prepared them to endure the hour of temptation. God's people were strengthened by the excellent glory which rested upon them in rich abundance and prepared them to endure the hour of temptation. So you find 
that from these quotes, God's people will literally shine in the radiance of God's glory that will come and rest upon them. So when Jesus is speaking about people seeing our good works and glorifying God, he was speaking about the light or the glory streaming from the right kind of good works. Streaming from the right kind of good works. The ones that we have looked at that are prompted by having the righteousness of who? Of Christ, by loving God supremely and loving and selfishly our fellow, our fellow uh, man. Something that we cannot do on our own. So how do the saints become so glorious like the sun, that they shine like the sun? In Christ Object Lessons, page 414. Christ Object Lessons, page 414 says, so the followers of Christ are to shed light into the darkness of the world. Through the Holy Spirit, God's word is a light as it becomes a transforming power in the life of the receiver. By implanting in their hearts the principles of his word, the Holy Spirit develops in men the attributes of God. The light of his glory Dash, his character. So what is the light of his glory? It is his what? His character. Is to shine forth in his followers. Thus they are to glorify who? To glorify God. So what she's saying here is that the world is to see God in his saints by seeing God's character in what? In them. This is what it is talking about when it says that the earth is lightened with his glory because the Saints are showing the world the character of who? Of God. This idea can also be gotten by the experience of Moses in the Old Testament. When Moses asked God in Exodus 33, 18 uh, and 19, and I, he said, I beseech thee, show me thy what? Thy glory. 18 and 19. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before thee and I will proclaim the name of, of the Lord. So in Exodus, in answer to this, uh, this plea by Moses, God answers, Exodus 34, 6 and 7, where I remember he says, and the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed, the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and what? And sin. So this is the character of God that he was proclaiming. And we have seen that the character of God is what? Is love. Our God is love. And when he proclaimed his character, he proclaimed these attributes that are described here in Exodus 34. So his character, his love, is going to be seen like glory, like the sun coming up in the morning and covering uh, the earth. So the day when the earth will be, will be lightened with his glory was prophesied in both the Old and the New and the New Testament, as we have seen. God will be seen as he really is, not as people suppose he is. There is a very, very big difference, and that began at Eden. Once Adam and Eve fell into sin, things happened, and they started uh, the picture that they had of God in their mind was so perverted from what God actually was to the extent that they started running away from him. God who used to come and be with them every day in the evening. So after 6,000 years, how much perversion has been done to this character of God? Big, big time. So human beings will be able to show the world what God is actually uh, like. Now, this light is needed because we are told, like we have read in Isaiah 62, uh, that darkness will cover the earth and gross darkness the people. But the Lord shall arise upon thee, and his glory shall be seen upon thee. So in this darkness, gross darkness that is covering the people, that is the time that God's people will show forth the character of God. That is his glory to the world that is light and is going to lighten the whole uh, earth. Ellen White says about this darkness in Christ Object Lessons, page 414. 
commenting on this darkness of Isaiah 60 and verse 2. Ellen White is clear in Christ Object Lessons, page 415, that what is this darkness? It is the darkness of misapprehension of God. It is the darkness of misapprehension of God that is enshrouding the world. It is the darkness of the misapprehension of God that is the, doing what? That is shrouding and shrouding the world. He continues that men are losing their knowledge of his character. It has been misunderstood and misinterpreted. So what is the darkness in the last days? A misapprehension of God, fearing him that is enshrouding us. Men are losing the knowledge of his character. People have their own ideas. Some think God is like an ATM machine. You put plant seed and go and press and money comes out. Some think God is a motivational speaker, like this world is not going to end. There are so many someone's are here in different places where they are so good, they give hope, but it is just temporary hope for the life that is here or not. No preparation for the life that is to come. In Adventism, now we have turned also, it is just like money, money. We have turned him into a, an ATM machine of some sort. So people have different ideas. And this is what the Bible calls darkness. It has been misunderstood and misinterpreted. This means even in God's people, within God's people, this thing of misinterpreting and misapprehension of God is going on. We become fearful of God. We have been doing wrong for so long that we fear to come, to come before him. Yet we are told that after Adam and Eve fell into sin, it is God who looked for, for them. Romans 5, 8, we are told, but God commended, commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for what? Christ died for us. He came to save us sinners. We need not chase him away. If he didn't want to come, he would not have come. But he came because he is love and God is love. So he's the only one who can take away uh, that separation that occurred between us and God, that is Christ Jesus. Christ is the sin bearer who carries away all the sin. So they have been placed upon him. And therefore, they are no longer separate because Christ took them away. There is no wall of partition dividing man and God anymore, like it was in the Old Testament theology, that causes people to fear God, like the Pharisees, twice when Christ cleansed the temple, when divinity shone through humanity. And these people, it was like he was seeing through them. And we are told that they wanted to be as far away from him as they could be able to get. Yet you find that women and little children were in the presence of Christ. So it is possible for us to be comfortable like the women and children in the presence of who? Of God. So there is a gross misunderstanding about God. So the, one of the tasks of the church in these last days is that they must gain a correct understanding of God. Many people do not understand God. Many members of the church, many parents. No wonder people are afraid of who? Of God. No wonder we do not feel like we are fully accepted even when we have come and decided that we are repenting. We think that he is a tyrant. He is dictatorial and oppressive. And we cringe in our guilt. But God, if we read properly in the Bible, is not like that at all. Now, this is the darkness that you're told is enshrouding the world, a misapprehension of God. And we must go back and present him as Christ did when he walked upon this earth. Because Christ, remember, we said, he said that he that hath seen me hath seen who? Hath seen the Father. And that is what the world is actually uh, waiting for. So the Bible promises that amidst this darkness, light is going to shine, the light of the glory of God. Christ Object Lessons, page 415, continues. 
continues by saying, that as at this time, that is when there is darkness in the earth, a message from God is to be proclaimed, a message illuminating in its influence and saving in its power. So at this time when there is darkness, a message from God is to be proclaimed. This message should be illuminating in its influence and saving in its power. His character is to be made known. That is the message. Making known of the character of God is the what? Is the message. Into the darkness of the world is to be shed the light of his glory, the light of his goodness, mercy, and truth. Notice what we are seeing here. That we must do more than speak about this. It is more than a proclamation. It is a demonstration, a manifestation, so that the world sees God in his people. His character is to be demonstrated in our lives. It continues that the children of God, the quote, Christ Object Lessons, page 415, the children of God are to manifest his glory, and to manifest his glory. In their own life and character, they are to reveal what the grace of God has done for them. The light of the sun of righteousness is to shine forth in good works, in words of truth and deeds of what? Of holiness. In words of truth and deeds of holiness. So God is counting upon his people to manifest him to the world, to demonstrate what his true character is like, that he is truly a God of what? A God of love. Now we saw how impossible a task it is when we depend on our own strength, when we depend on our own trying, when we depend on our own, our own ways. But we saw that it is God who has promised to make us like that. His goal is to make you a light of his glory. His goal is to make me a light of his glory, of his character, to manifest his character, so that I might be able to glorify him in my good works, which will not only be my good works, but his works working through, through me. He is able to accomplish that. And that is his goal. And that should be our goal, to cooperate with him, so that this uh, is actually accomplished. Isaiah wrote about this in a slightly different language in Isaiah 49. Isaiah 49. Isaiah uses slightly different language, but notice how similar it also is. It says, O Zion, that bringest good tidings, get thee up into the holy mountain. O Jerusalem, that bringeth good tidings, Lift up thy voice, thy voice with strength. Lift it up, be not afraid. Say unto the cities of Judah, this is what I want us to notice. Behold your what? Your God. Behold your God. So the message is not so much out of good words, but it is something that is going to be seen. It is going to be demonstrated so that Isaiah here says, behold your what? Behold your God. Those who are waiting for the bridegroom's coming are to say to the people like Isaiah is saying here, behold your what? Behold your God. In Object Lessons, page 415, Ellen White says that the last rays of merciful light, the last message of mercy to be given to the world is a revelation of his character of what? Of love. Object Lessons 415, the last rays, the last rays of merciful light, the last message of mercy to be given to the world is a revelation of his character of what? Is a revelation of his character of love. So the world, apart from Christ, has not seen God. Apart from Christ who came and revealed God, Nobody else has been able to do that. Jesus was the only one who truly revealed him to the world. And now we are told that there will be a message that will lighten the whole world, that we, they will say, behold God in his people. 
and that God is what? Is love. We are told that the world will be able to see that. There will be no plagues before the world actually sees this because this is how God operates. He has to warn his people. He has to show his character first before he actually now does the strange work that he's going to do in the last days. So no plagues will come until this character of God is manifested in his people so that people have an opportunity to make their minds whether they will be on the side of God or they will stick to the enemy of God, the devil. So there will be no return also. And that is what we were talking about. The delay was caused by a cutting short, a rejection of the message of this uh, loud cry of the third angel's message that had begun when the message of righteousness by faith was brought by John and who and Wagoner. So this is the last message. And remember, we are talking about present truth. So how much present truth do you think it should be in our lives and in our churches? So we preach that Christ is coming soon. He is coming soon to take vengeance upon those who have not accepted and have not uh, uh, welcomed him in their lives. So we teach that our judgment is going on and we will need to be ready for Jesus, otherwise we'll be able to burn with the devil and those who have rejected him. But the question now we need to ask ourselves, how if we were to be the other people that are being preached to, how would we receive this message? How have we been preaching? Does it reveal a God who is a God of love so that we know the priorities, even in our preaching, if not demonstration in our lives? Is he a God of love? Would we receive this message, if we were the people to whom we try to preach to and bring to our side, the side of God. So we are not supposed to frighten people into believing uh, this message. God hates sin, but he hates the word. God hates uh, the sin, but he loves the word, the sin. And it is God who can be able to distinguish between uh, these acts of sin and actually hating the people. As we do not have that. Uh, ability to make that good distinction. But God, we are told, he can make that uh, distinction very well. So we need to show that God is a God of love. And this is the message that the people are actually waiting for, so that they can be wooed by his love to his side, and then they will be ready for the second coming uh, of Christ Jesus. On the opposite side, we have the beast power, who is going to deceive people by the miracles, who is going to deceive people that he is a religious uh, organization and then will make the people to make laws to force others to worship in a particular what? In a particular way. He drives people to worship the so-called God that they will be worshiping at that time in a way that clearly is against the commandments of God, especially the ones that have to do with loving your fellow man. So as we wind up, how is it that God's people will be like God in character? Second Corinthians 4, 6, we are told that for God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So God shines light that gives us knowledge and understanding about his character. And as we behold Jesus, we behold our heavenly father. And a light and understanding comes into us and the glory of his character becomes a glory to us, just like it was to Moses in the Mount when he beheld the glory of God in the law and in the sacrifice. His face, we are told, shined so brightly that the people could not look upon him until he had to cover his face with a veil. This was a human being who had walked so closely with God, that he literally glorified God physically because it was physical, he had to cover it, as well as spiritual, for he was a reflector of that brilliance, of the light that he had beheld there in the world, in the mountain. Now, how is it that God's people will be like him in character? It is a creative act, like we are told in 2 Corinthians 4, 6. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness? This was in Genesis. So God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shined in our, in our hearts. As he created and separated light from darkness, so he will be able to create light in the darkened minds of his people 
and the people of the world in these last days, because that is the darkness that we have seen. What the meaning of darkness in these last days, a misapprehension of his word, of his character. And they are told that it is going to be a miraculous creative act. In Ephesians 4.24, Paul also speaks about the old man being put off and we are to be renewed in the spirit of your mind that you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true word and true holiness. So the new creature or creation is a creative act. God makes a new person. And just like he caused the light to shine out of darkness in the beginning, so he does now in you and me and others in these last days where the earth is filled with what? With darkness. And he wants this to be shown to the world. To the world. Paul speaking in 2 Corinthians 3.18 again says, but we all with open face beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord. The glory which you have seen to be the character of God, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. So, beholding, in 2 Corinthians 3.18, with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, that is beholding his character, we are changed in the same image from glory to glory, from character to character, even as by the Spirit of God. So as we spend this time with him, as we adore him, as we become devoted to him and see his glory, his character, we are also changed into the same character, even from glory to glory, from one degree to another, until we are told we shall shine as the stars in their what, in their beauty. So that is what we are required to do before we shine and have this character of God. Paul continues in 2 Corinthians 4, 7, that we have this treasure, that is the glory, this character, this beauty, in earthen vessels. And why the distinction here in earthen vessels? Because earth sinful human what? Human bodies. So we have this treasure, this glory, this character of God in corrupt human bodies. Why? So that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of and not of us. This is very important. And sometimes these are the things that we miss when we are reading the Bible. We have this treasure, this glory, this character, this beauty in earthen vessels, in corrupt human bodies. So that what can happen? So that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. So everyone knows, every human being knows that we are not like God. And everyone knows that in our corrupt God bodies, we cannot produce a character like that of God. This has been demonstrated for over 6,000 years. Therefore, if we become like God, all the praise will go to who? To God and not to us. Because the people who have the same flesh like us will see and know that, no, this, this, is, this is something that is, is not of themselves. So when God shines in our hearts and changes us by beholding his glory, we are changed from glory to glory. Everyone knows that God has brought this about. This change has been done by some power outside of these men because we share the same flesh and we are not be able, we, have not be, we cannot be able to become what they have become. So eventually the world praises God and not his people because the message is Christ, our righteousness and not we our righteousness. The first angel's message says we are to worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. First, we must worship the creator. He's the only one who can make light shine out of darkness and the minds of many today are darkened even on this aspect of the God that is to be worshipped in this Revelation 14, 7. It is God who had a son called Jesus, who was his literal son, because that is how we can be able to understand the manifestation of the love that they had for us. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. I mean, if it was any other thing, that it means it was not love. If it was role play and all, all this confusion that we have in these last days about God, 
the personality of God. That it means all these messages that we are speaking about will not be able to make sense because God is God is joking. He's claiming that he sent his son, yet it was not his real son. It was someone masquerading as the son. And immediately I come to that realization, then I'll start having different thoughts. Is God serious in what he has written in the scriptures? Where else is he joking around? He says this and he means another different thing. So the first angel's message, by the way, is very important. This is why there must be a restoration of the God of the Bible and his son, Christ Jesus, and their spirit through whom they dwell with us and we are transformed from glory to glory. So by, that is this is why the Bible also does not make sense to many people, when we have perverted so many things in the Bible. But the greatest one anyway that you're speaking about in this uh, session is Christ, our righteousness as present truth. It is a message that has to be repeated and given first priority in our preaching because it is supposed to lead to a demonstration of the character of God in the lives of his people. So we must worship the creator. We must be quickened by the spirit in 1 Peter 3.18. Then he will shine in our minds so that the darkness of mystery will be taken away. And then we will be able to see God as he is. So we become like him while the others worship the beast and his image, going back to the beast and his image, which are man-made powers, obeyed in man's strength, and then they will not be able to be transformed by the divine, divine one. Remember, we started looking at those two comparisons between Babylon, where Nebuchadnezzar built in his own strength, and we said we look at it through uh, Christ our righteousness aspect. If we are saying Nebuchadnezzar uh, was, was wanted to be righteous in his own way, then you can see that in the years that he was building the city of Babylon, if that was righteousness, it was the wrong kind of righteousness. It was the one that the Pharisees had, neglecting, being ignorant of the righteousness of God. They went about seeking their own what? Righteousness. And this Nebuchadnezzar did, that is not these, these righteous works that I have done, I have done in the power of my strength and for my own honor, yet, the message is Christ, our righteousness, not we are what? We are our righteousness. So in the beast, in Babylon system, we have man-made laws because this power shall think to change laws so that maybe they can be lowered to the extent that man can be able to, 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 to keep them, both they think in the spirit and in the letter. Yet on this other side, Christ, our righteousness, the law has to be elevated to a point whereby it is impossible for man to keep them. And that is why he can be able to seek for a power outside of himself that will be able to keep, uh, to keep uh, this law through Christ who will be in them. So these are man-made laws in the beast power. They are obeyed in man's strength and not the characters will not be transformed by the divine, the divine one. So here is the big difference. And many of us, we attempt to make ourselves better in our own strength, not knowing that we are joining with those who are worshiping the beast and his image. We are in Babylon with our man-made laws that we are attempting to keep. It is all man-made unless it is Christ our what? Our righteousness. So these distinctions become wide between those who love God and those who are being forced or are trying to force themselves to love him. One group trusts only him and his righteousness and not their own. They are treated, they are recreated by his power through his spirit and not on their own. They are transformed by his glory until all praise is to him and not to themselves. The other group will take the praise to themselves for their own efforts to satisfy God's uh, laws. So God's goal in these last days, is not for me and for you to be good enough to be saved. This is something that must be taken away. Our goal is not to be good enough so that we reach a certain threshold and now this was good enough. God can cover up the remaining part like I've had said so many times and then you are saved. It has never been like that. God's goal for every human being is to be like him. 
That is the character, the image that we lost when Adam and Eve fell into sin. He wants to be seen in the world through his people. The world understands us that we are human beings, flesh that is fallen, but they do not understand God. And it is in this darkness that light is to shine. This darkness must be taken away by them being able to see God in his people before Christ can be able to come back. So the goal of Christ, our righteousness and justification by faith is not simply to be good enough to get to heaven. It is not striving to be obedient. Christ himself says, come unto me, all those who are heavy laden with trying to seek for their own righteousness and I shall be able to give you rest. God does not want to pat us on the back and say, you have done a good job. Hmm? He says, you have honored me, I will honor you. You have glorified me, I will glorify you. So the world cannot be saved by seeing us becoming better and better. We have tried that experiment for 6,000 years and it has failed terribly. But at the end, the Bible we have seen promises both in the Old and the New Testament. Light is going to be able to shine. There are people who will be able to manifest the character of God in their lives, thus being able to show the people in the world the character of God, which is the character of love. So the world must be saved by God. They must see him, they must love him, they must adore him, they must receive his person, but they do not know him until they can be able to see him in us. So what will be, we will be a revelation of our God to a dying world. In First John, in First John 3, 2, John says the same principle when he says that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. When he shall appear, we shall be like him which is an impossibility if you take it like it's your own efforts that are supposed to make you be like, like Christ. Because we know very well that we cannot be able to be like Christ. But once we understand the creator and the power of God unto salvation, which Paul calls the gospel, it is not about what we can do, but rather what he will do with us when we permit him to do that. Ministry of Healing, page 161. There is this line that it is his glory to pardon the chief of sinners. It is his glory to pardon the chief of sinners. And his glory we have seen is his character. God does not care how bad the people are. Because by the way, apart from misapprehension of the character of God, in the last days we are told the devil will be working through human instrumentalities. And the crimes like in the days of Noah before shall be repeated. Or when Christ was upon this earth where Devils were possessing people and doing crazy things. So the law of God will be trampled upon seriously. And therefore, that is why this message is going to be very important. It does not matter how low the people will have sunk because it is, it is his glory to pardon the chief of the sinners. So they need to understand that God is love. Then they need to see this God who is love in his people. Then they will be able to come to God. So the issue of that they are so bad that they cannot be saved will not uh, arise. There will be no hopeless cases because the Lord is capable. The Lord is not too small to be able to forgive these big sins. He has to be very big to be able to forgive the sins that will be taking place uh, in these last days. As we draw to a close, when does the light of the angel come to lighten the earth? In the book of Isaiah 58, 6, it is made clear by the gospel prophet Isaiah. In Isaiah 58, 6, when this light of the angel shall come to lighten the earth, it says, then shall thy light break forth as the morning, and thine health shall spring forth speedily, and thy righteousness shall go before thee, for the glory of the Lord shall be thy rare word, rare God. So Isaiah 58, 6 begins in Isaiah 58, 1, so that we get the dead. In 6, it begins by saying, then, so it is speaking about a particular time. And what is this time? What are the events that will happen and usher in the 
events that are now taking place in Isaiah 6 going forward, referred to as then. So it begins by saying, in the previous two verses actually, that is not this the first that I have chosen to lose the bands of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens and to let the oppressed go free and that you break every yoke? Is it not to deal thy bread to the hungry and that thou bring the poor that are cast out to thy house? When thou seest the naked, that thou cover him and that thou hide not thyself from thine own flesh? Then verse six and seven happens. That when this shall happen, then shall thy light break forth as the morning, and thy righteousness shall go before, before thee. If these things are done, Isaiah is saying, then God will be seen. Thus, in the night of spiritual darkness, God's glory is to shine forth through his church in lifting up the bowed down and comforting those that are mourning. Sorrow shall fill the earth. The gap between the rich and the poor shall be so wide, it's going to be crazy. And in this darkness of transgression of the laws of God, God's glory is to be seen in his people. There will be needy and distress. They will need to be relieved. They will need to be healed using simple remedies. Practical work will have far more effect than sermonizing. We are to give food to the hungry clothing to the naked and shelter to the homeless, says Isaiah. And we are called to do more than this in Object Lessons, Christ Object Lessons, page 417. Len White says that the ones of the soul, only the love of Christ can satisfy. If Christ is abiding in us, our hearts will be full of divine sympathy. The sealed fountains of honest Christ-like love will be unsealed. So this is what Christ is yearning to give to us, a tender heart that sympathizes with his people because those are the people of God. He created them and that he has compassion on them that he sent Christ to also die for them. So we need to be sensitive to their needs because those are God's people and he will supply all their needs according to his riches in glory, no matter who's, no matter what those uh, needs are. So this is the goodness of God that will be reflected and manifested in humanity. God will be seen in the person of his saints. This is what we are actually waiting for. In Isaiah 63, the Bible says the result of this light is that the Gentiles that we read, the Gentiles or unbelievers shall come to thy light and the kings to the brightness of thy rising. So a tremendous in gathering is here being foretold, a great harvest of souls that will take place. Multitudes came during Pentecost. We are told that at the falling of the latter rain, those that shall be saved shall even be great. Habakkuk 2.14 uh, says, prophesies that the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. The earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. I want to finish by reading the last quote from Ellen White from 7 BC, page 984. Ellen White is commenting on this Bible text, Habakkuk 2.14, that the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Ellen White is saying, commenting on that, that another, another angel comes down from heaven having great power and the earth is to be lightened with his glory. The spirit of the Lord will so graciously bless consecrated human instrumentalities that men, women, and children will open their lips in praise and thanksgiving, filling the earth with the knowledge of God and with his unsurpassed glory as the waters cover the water, cover the sea. You would think that she's commenting about the text in Revelation 18. This is an Old Testament prophet prophesying of the same event. It will be so extensive that there will be millions of people who will be shining for God, filled with the glory and manifesting his character, that the whole earth will be full of his glory. Human beings, multitudes in every land will shine for God saying, 
Behold your God, he is like us and we are actually like him. So we are to proclaim his glory and grace, not just by summons, but every moment and every hour that we live, wherever we live, wherever we go, we cannot preach the loud cry in words. We have to live the loud cry. And this is something very important that I realized as I was going through this. That a message is lived, not just by words, by saying, but it has to be lived because it gives impetus now to the words that you will be speaking. It is God's glory to pardon the chiefest of sinners. It does not matter how low people will have gone. God will manifest himself in you if you accept him and give him that opportunity to glorify himself in you. And the world will be amazed and as they behold God in what? In humanity. Then we are told that Jesus is going to come. That quote, Christ is longing, with, is waiting with longing desire. When the character of God shall be perfectly reproduced in his people, then he shall come to claim them as his own. So that is what is holding back the second coming of Christ. That is the event that has to take place, that is holding back the other events that are also supposed to happen before the second coming of Christ. How I wish that he would come into our hearts. How he longs to rise like the sun in the morning in our lives, warming us on the inside until on the outside we are able to manifest his works that the people might be able to say that behold, those people have something outside of themselves in earthen vessels like we also have. Matthew 5, 16 says, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father, which is in heaven. So this is present truth. It means that we have to do away with some of the messages that we have and give prominence to this message because it ranks up there with, I don't know what, what I can compare it to. Of course, all the messages that we have in the Bible are true, but this ranks up, up there. It has to be repeated to the people. It has to be told whenever we are because it has to be acted out in good works that will be able to show the world what kind of God that we actually are. So, so this is a message that is of utmost importance and how sad that we have depreciated this message and that depreciation has caused many not to see its worth and value and importance in their lives and therefore we will even fail to experience Christ as their righteousness, as our righteousness and we will be able to fail to prepare because we will be looking at the last day events, the mark of the beast and all these other things keeping here they who keep the commandments of God through a legalistic lens. And then we will find that we are in Babylon and think that we actually are, are experiencing Christ, our righteousness. So may we think upon this uh, message. May we place it where it is supposed to be placed in the list of priorities of messages that we share with people in these last days in Jesus' name. Let us bow as we finish before we take questions and comments. Our Father in heaven, we come before you once again to thank you for the light that you are constantly shedding upon our hearts, Father, that you shed upon the pioneers of this movement, Father. Who knew that they were in a movement, Father, not to become so complacent, Father, just being any other church in this world. But they had a mission, Father, that they were to accomplish. That is to prepare people to stand when the second coming of Christ shall be able to take place. And prepare the world for this great event by revealing your character, Father, to the world that they may make the decision. Well, Father, we thank you for the opportunity that you're still giving us, Father. Still in this era of freedom, Father, that we are freely able to study your word. For the night cometh in which we will not be able to operate as we are operating today. May you continue strengthening us, transforming us, Father, for this is our prayer, trusting and believing in the precious name of Christ. Amen.